Sometimes when we talk We don't know what the f*** So we have to call and ask a friend I want to know the things you know It'll make a better show You're the one on whom we all depend Hey everybody, welcome to UNFTR's Phone a Friend. Our guest today is the great Francesca Fiorentini, one of my favorite political commentators in the progressive universe. Smart, funny, insightful. Francesca has had a colorful career as a stand-up comedian and a media commentator for several years. Now, perhaps you saw her on our show Newsbroke on AJ+. Maybe you've seen her as a contributor to The Young Turks or The Majority Report, as a host of So That Happened on AMC or hosting shows on Nat Geo. Maybe you saw her special Red, White & Who covering the healthcare crisis in America on MSNBC. Or maybe, like me, you join her every week in the Bituation Room, her podcast and YouTube show that is growing exponentially and bringing new audience members into the fold every day. If you're any of these things, then you are prepared for the force of nature and funny that is Francesca. If you have yet to discover this multifaceted talent, then, well, you're welcome. Francesca Fiorentini, I am such a huge fan, which my audience already knows. So it is a it's it's so great to have you here. Uh, I was able to kind of get my fangirling out before we came on camera. Yeah. So yeah, I'm done with that. And this is a serious, serious interview now. Francesca. There was crochet, people. If you're listening, there was a lot of homemade crafts with my face on it. A little awkward for your boy, Max. But no, uh, so good to be here. Thank I you so much for I do have the pillow behind words. me. <laughs> No, no problem. No problem. So I have to start out with a a question of etiquette, uh -huh. as this is UNFTR. This is not the Bituation Room, but right. I've uh, I've often called out the Bituation Room on our podcast and uh, written about it in our newsletter uh, because, first of all, you have wonderful guests. You've been able Thank to, you. I mean, bring on a, and a wide array of guests that are some serious, some incredibly critical, uh, and some just a lot of fun to hang with, which has yeah. been which has been great. Adds a lot of dimension to the show. Uh, but you start off famously a lot of your shows by asking, "Hey, what are you bitching about?" So, if I may be so bold as to ask you and to share one of my own, hey, Francesca, what are you bitching about? Oh, here's what. Okay, here's what I'm bitching about. Um, this is it might sound petty. I'm bitching about a lot of stuff. There's so much, but let's make it non-Trump related and uh, make it sort of silly. In that, I think, given the climate apocalypse, obviously that we're you know working very hard to stop, but can't really stop some of the impacts of. I think there are enough pools, swimming pools, in this country everyone to like have a nice pool at for like once a week do you know what i'm saying meaning meaning that pools should be redistributed the way once like once the revolution happens and we unfuck the mm -hmm. republic my my like realm my department will be redistributing everyone's swimming pools so we can all go swimming because it's 90 degrees in Los Angeles uh, and it's yes. like the heat waves are not going away. It's just wave after wave after wave. And there's all these like apps where you can rent someone's pool for like an exorbitant <laughs> amount of money. And I yes, I've done that. And some of them are like, by the way, there's no bathroom. And you're like, honey, you know what that means? If there's no bathroom and you're renting me your pool, That's right. I'm going to pee in the pool. You know, I have a baby. <laughs> She's definitely going to pee in the pool. But like, so, so I just feel like we need to distribute the resources of that we have more equitably. And look, healthcare, of course, general like housing and all that. Like, oh, there's many things, but maybe like 18th on the list is swimming pools. Uh, I feel the same about uh, golf courses as well, <laughs> and redistributing that land. I think more equitably and uh, oh, allowing God, people yeah. to sort of frolic on them so yeah i think that's a solid bitch so are you are you suggesting double f that uh the free market won't be able to manage the distribution of pool water in an equitable fashion <laughs> no i mean look <laughs> 
the in Sri Lanka recently, the best image that came out of that like massive uprising against the government that uh, has toppled like multiple presidents and multiple days and whatnot was just like the people storming the presidential palace and just in the tight pool that he had, just like vibing. And that's what I feel like the revolution will look like. But in general, I just feel, look, you can, let's say, if you're in a neighborhood, you've got a pool, but you don't, you're not using it every day. And maybe there's a family or, you know, a neighbor who could come over and use it and you'll get like a tax rebate. If Biden could include that in his Inflation Reduction Act, you know, maybe Gen Z and millennials will come out and vote for him again. Not only that, but we won't really notice uh, that outside of the pool, we're all just boiling. Exactly. Just, just boiling just to boiling. death. Absolutely. Yeah, it'll, no, I think I mean, it'll make the, the ease into extinction a little more palatable. Right. So and it should it. be obligatory because, sorry, the just last thing, like in the way that golfing is like really, really golf course, like with real grass. I mean, yeah. the grass, the best part about golf courses is it, then they get mowed every single goddamn day. So you're like, oh, all this water for some shit, you're just gonna keep this yeah. tall. Yeah. Just put AstroTurf, you privileged a-holes. <laughs> God damn it. If it's good enough for the Women's World Cup, which I guess they thought it was, although now we hate the women because they lost, but we didn't care when they won. It's a whole thing. So yeah, swimming pools and uh, being able to- I'm not- I'm not prepared to talk about U.S. women's loss just oh, no. yet. I have a um, – yeah, my youngest is a very, very talented soccer player. Um, and wow. How old? We're very devoted, uh, college-bound soon, uh, to, and to play in college, no less. And, and uh, so I'm very, very emotionally tethered to the U.S. women's team and all that they've done for uh, equal pay and for the yes. potential future of daughters like mine. So, um, yeah, I'm not I'm not ready to go there. It stings a little, but it's OK. It's all right. It's OK. We went out to there's a good always... team, you know, like, I mean, they're, you know, yeah. there's a formidable. And the fact that there's parity, there's parity among the European teams. It really is their sport, if we're being honest. So it's OK. Exactly. And a lot give of our it, you know, a lot them. of our women play abroad. So it's OK. Right, right, um, right. What are you bitching about? Things, are you gonna? Are, yeah, I am. I and now I feel weird because it's a little self serious. But um, yeah, one of the things I'm bitching about is, uh, and I think that maybe we can build on this to have a discussion about the the kind of the nature of where the left is right now. Ooh. Um, is all of the heat that uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez is taking, not from the normal places or where it's always come from, but from People that I, I consider allies on the left uh, mm -hmm. and the far left really taking aim. And and so I'm, I'm actually preparing a, a, a column and a podcast on this and I was hoping to kind of work my thoughts out with you a little bit to get your perspective on on this. Because every time I, I read a harsh critique of her from the left, it's not that they're, it, it's invalid to criticize the people who have said that they would stand for the interests of the left. But I find the criticisms themselves remarkably invalid for what they fail to attack, which is all of the other so-called progressives or leftists or even left-leaning liberal Democrats that are doing much of the same or not doing anywhere near what she has done. The amount yeah. of education that she's provided to young people to be able to be more informed about not just leftist policies, policies but how the government works. I mean, yes. what she's done through social media has been transformative in so many ways. For the most part, if you look at her distribution of her votes and proposed legislation on Ballotpedia, or if you look on uh, Progressive Punch, she is at the furthest extreme of the left that you can be within the system that we have. And it's almost like the leftists wanted her to be elected and then to immediately leave government and just start throwing Molotov cocktails from outside of Congress and be like, ha, I did it. I got in and now I'm leaving because I can't work within the system. And it's like, no, no, you, you wanted her to be a part of the system, not apart yeah. from the system. And and I so I really can't reconcile and all. So I feel like a lot of it is at its core just misogynistic. And it's because she pre presents with what my daughters call pretty privilege in the world that if she's going to be out there and garner all this attention 
really through no fault of her own because we're obsessed with her as a media culture, that then she is going to then have to withstand this withering criticism from literally every side of the spectrum. And, I, and I'm struggling with that because I do want her to do more. I want her to do better. I want them all to, I want every one of the progressive caucus to do more, to do better, and to be stronger. But then there are the realities that there are, you know, 434 other people trying to work assiduously against them every yeah. step of the way. So that's what I'm bitching about. And I just, I was hoping I could actually bitch to you and sort of contextualize that and get your feelings on it. I, I mean, I, I have to say I'm right there with you on just how hollow many of these critiques are. And they're done by a lot of folks two critiques of the critiques that I have, I feel like um, they are done often for clout and clicks, and even folks who say and swear that, no, no, they're not done for that, they are ultimately done for that. Um, when you tweet at AOC, when you make her the target, you put her face on the cover of your you know, YouTube thumbnail, and you said, has she sold us out? Like, you know what that, that's doing. I'm thinking of, you know, Jimmy Dore, whose name I can't say two more times, otherwise he'll pop up from behind my shoulder. <laughs> um, you know, there's a, and there's other people, it's obviously not just him, but it's a lot of people who, who do that just for clout. I think also what is important to note is who from leftist publications, talking about the American prospects, something I contribute to, current affairs, um, in these times, serious left publications, which, which ones of those have done deep dives and good, honest, earnest critiques of AOC very few, and I don't mean that because it doesn't e exist. I'm saying that the places we've seen a lot of the critiques coming from are New York Magazine, just recently. This dude, Freddie DeBoer, who I don't actually even know, um, but the article is flimsy. It just, there's nothing concrete about the legislation she has gotten behind. It's nothing concrete about what she's done in her district. And granted, I'm not an AOC like, like, Superhead. I don't know all the ballot measures that she's put forward. I don't know everything that she's co-signed. I don't know all of that. But what I do know is that there is a line of thinking, which is once you get elected, you must always be fighting, 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 fighting. And the problem with that is, and trust me, take it from someone who's like terrible in a work environment. <laughs> <laughs> These are your coworkers. You can't get anything done if you're the like, you know, yeah, for like pretty girl in the corner who's like, no, you know what I mean? Like, that's not good enough for me. It's like, right, which would be even worse. Right. Totally. And and she talks about how she's told The New York Times about this she in many other interviews as well, which is a critique. AOC should give interviews and she does to The Intercept from time to time. She should give interviews to leftist you know, outlets. I want her to come on my show, been wanting her to come on my show for a while. And again, not, I, I'm whatever. Put that aside. But she said, look, Hakeem Jeffries is also, you know, new speaker of the House for the Democrats, has also been throwing incredible amounts of shade, talking behind her back, calling her a social media influencer. So she's getting it from all sides to say that she right. is, as Freddie DeBoer says in his New York Magazine, or that she's just a regular Democrat is just completely bad faith. Regular Democrats absolutely hate her and they still hate mm -hmm. her. And they hate Ilhan Omar and they hate Cori Bush and they hate Ayanna Presley and they hate, you know, they they hate a lot of these young squad members. They hate oh, Jamal Bowman, his his shouting matches. If you just go in there fighting like you're saying and then like say, oh, I worked within the system, you're basically Marjorie Taylor Greene. That's all you right. are. You're building your own personal brand. You've got your little MTG podcast with weird fucking Ellen font. And, you know, you're like, you know, it's the swamp. It's like, bitch, you're in the swamp. Why don't you do something for your constituency? And so I think, look, I came up in a time when we had no squad, no progressives. It may be just like right. one. I mean, Bernie was around, but like no one really knew about him. Um, but there was an I think to a fault for the left. A very simple minded um, disregard for electoral politics. And the squad has given us, us reason to invest, not fully, I still believe in outside movements, but invest a little bit more. And yeah, understand how these bills are working, what is happening, like what can and can't be done, what are the constraints, what are the, and if you, I mean, if you really want to go there, and I think the reality is 
most leftists and most people, including myself, man, I'm not a super wonk. Like, I don't know all the ins and outs. I look to others for that information. But but I do know that that knee jerk response to saying like, oh, she sold us out is just I, I, I have so much disagreement with that. And I think it's completely it's it's not based on reality. Well, and, and uh, do you think that there is a, a strong element of misogyny in it? Because one of the benchmarks that I usually use for progressive house politics is Earl Blumenauer from Oregon. Most, most people are like, who? And right. it's like, oh, my yeah. man's been doing this since the 90s. And he wears a little funky Tucker Carlson kind of bow tie. He's an, he's an older dude now, but he's like, he's been critical of Israel since yeah. he got into the house. He's been pushing marijuana legislation since he got into the house. I mean, my dude is a stone cold radical and he is right of AOC and and literally gets no shade from anybody ever because he's an older white dude from Oregon who's not, you know, pretty for the cameras or any of that. And right. he's a guy. He's a white right. dude. And so he's almost dismissed. So Jamal Bowman, I think, is a perfect example. Oh, look, there's that angry black guy again. And then yes. you've got AOC and then, oh, you've got the little Latina feminist over there. And they're de and they're derided in such specific ways that even when they, they take criticism from the left, that part isn't spoken and yet seems to me so freaking obvious. Yeah, so, and, and I mean, it's do you think that there's of... an element of that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, look, I think as radicals, as socialists, as people who, you know, do want to severely rein in, if not dismantle and replace capitalism, uh, maybe not in our lifetimes, but, you know, we, I, you know, I think identity politics are radical politics. They always were, you know, they were spearheaded by, you know, radical black women and queer women in the 80s. Um, and they've been whitewashed and watered down by by corporations, by everyone, by, uh, by yes, leading Democrats. But I do feel like the leftists who even deny, let's say, let's take a more obvious example, that Hillary Clinton was targeted uh, with sexism and misogyny. It's like, no, mm -hmm. you, <laughs> you gotta be an, just an idiot. Like, yes, all of the reasons that Hillary Clinton should not have been the nominee, all of the reasons I personally politically disagree with her points, you know, uh, her generally, but like, was there a massive era of misogyny? Yeah. Huh. Oh, yeah. Did it make me deeply rethink and think about how how much patriarchy plays into our electoral politics and electoralism and what it's going to take to get a woman elected to the highest office? Yes, very much so. Yeah. Um, especially a woman who's not doing the bidding of the far right, which I think sadly might be our first female president unless AOC has anything to do with it or say say about it but yeah I think there's a there's a heavy the problem is whenever you talk about that the left always accuses you of being lib about it like oh you're doing you know right. just pure you know basic identity politics and it's like no you can still have a radical critique and still be a, you know you can be a radical feminist and, and and critique sexism let's understand that um so anyway but but it's um I think it's important to actually study her record so I'm very excited for your podcast I'm very excited for the work that you're doing and also just thank you oh no I mean uh as a I, I think you said something important like we we can't master all of it that's why um you know whether you're you're commentators or you're just consumers of this information and you identify, but no matter where you identify on the political spectrum, there's very few people that are masters of so many disciplines that they could be considered experts in all of this stuff. And yet, when you look at what we expect of our elected representatives, we're asking them to do just that. And so whatever your personal peccadillo might be, you're expecting that person to be the you know an expert on that almost on day one whereas most congress people will tell you that then when they get there it's like being they get they get the equivalent of the phone book and they're like good luck you know totally we'll, they don't we'll even have their chambers. phone lines connected and they're and they're handcuffed in so many different ways i mean again this is like it's very funny because i was living abroad during the obama years many of the obama years i was in uh, argentina where were you uh, i was living in argentina oh, wow. I lived there for five years uh, that's where I started stand-up comedy. Very, very random place to start stand-up, but I did it in English huh. and in Spanish. Anyway, and I would always sort of, you know, when you're outside of the U.S. and you look 
to, you know, the Obama years. It was like, why isn't Obama doing more? Why isn't Obama doing more? And I think inside the U.S. it's very easy to say that. And then outside of it, I remember I would tell my friends in Argentina, like, why, you know, you know I'm a little disappointed because, you know, Obama is really, he could do more. And they would always be like, yeah, but wouldn't he just be killed? Like, wouldn't he just be <laughs> shot or assassinated? And I'm like, what do you, and they're like, you know, a black man as president doing anything too radical. And like, obviously that's hyperbolic. Obviously he t could have done more, but for sure the massive uh, barrage of, you know, racist obstructionism that he was subject to, I think needs to be you know, added into our overall assessment of the Obama years. Um, and so again, this is this is with all of these, with anyone we elect. And the last thing I'm going to say is, listen, what does a movement look like? You know, what does a mm. movement that AOC is actually accountable look like? You know, Justice Democrats is, you know, effectively like a, a campaign, um, like a vehicle. You know, it's not really a grassroots, you know, movement generated um, like move. Also, like it's not a movement. R.I.P. Yeah. And a Is little bit R.I.P. I mean, a they, rap? they have fired a lot of people. Um, they I mean, you know, or, or yeah, had to let go of a lot of folks. And I think they're now paring down and focusing purely on candidates and primaries. Um, and I think less on legislation, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Um which and I think yeah. they've been subject to what a lot of nonprofit organizations or activist organizations have, which is a precipitous decline in funding. Uh, and part of that is a result of the changes in the tax code that have not been re reinstated, which is which is bananas uh, that that didn't happen earlier. Um, but, yeah, Seriously. you see that. I think there was so much blowback on Justice Democrats um, and. But again, I, I, I kind of fault the left for that because the, the left was so busy. It's like once, I, you know, you said before, like, you know, just in your sh short span of, of being a commentator, you went from like, you know, and relative to, you know, the republic, no progressive in the caucus or, or in the House to then having nearly 100 in the progressive caucus. Yeah. Not all aligned 100 percent because they're humans and they're Democrats. And so that's never going to happen. Right. It's, the, it's still the equivalent of herding cats. But, wow, if that isn't progress, I don't know what is, at least from a representation standpoint. And yet you see the, the left pushes so much back on the justice Democrats that that has to resonate with the funding base as well, where people saying like, ooh, so even the left isn't happy about what they accomplished and so we're sort of doing ourselves a disservice by being so overly and extremely critical. And I'm not saying give give anybody on the left a pass, but just look at the at the stone cold facts of of what they're doing instead of just cherry picking the oh she wore this dress at the Met Gala she's an elitist like no yeah wow you know are we're we're so focused on the wrong things and that that same article is I think what you know got me to 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 bitch about this situation I I do want to ask you though. Um, mm -hmm. So you spent five years in Argentina. I think you spent some time in New York, if I'm not correct. Yeah, but you yeah, are went to undergrad, California native. California native, but uh, yeah, undergrad at NYU, which was a massive. That was 2001, September 2001. What wow. happened then? Um, but wow. a a uh, very much got involved in the anti-war movement immediately after 9/11, um, and quickly sort of, yeah, just became um, steeped in a lot of New York organizations, national organizations, um, but like major mobilizations going down to DC all the time. And we all remember, I mean, what 2003 looked like. And it was, you know, as the New York Times said, the second superpower. And that's what we were and that's what we felt like. And uh, mm -hmm. then we invaded. And so, yeah, that was that was kind of my on ramp into the world of activism and then got involved in a left magazine called Left Turn and which is R.I.P. but was great and kind of like came up around the same time as Jacobin. Jacobin survived and we did not. So then uh, you went back. When have you when did you go back to the left coast? Uh, went back in 2013 
to start working at AJ Plus of Al Jazeera Media Network. I had started stand up and I did like had a YouTube channel. Now I do stand up and have a YouTube channel. You know, I've come very far, Max. Um, <laughs> you know, it's been it's been a long time. But no, I it yeah, that's when I came back was to start work. I was always a fan of Al Jazeera Media. I love how they actually have um, reporters from the global south. Um, always the best international coverage. What? Why? Yeah, ew. Isn't it? But, it isn't it so much easier to north explain everything? <laughs> exactly. Just base That's everyone weird. in Miami, um, <laughs> which is just, I mean, it's so amazing. Like Latin America is so robust when it comes to media. Like it just, there's such good reporting, such amazing journalists. And the, the, the like gap between English language translation of that great reporting is massive. Um, mm -hmm. And so sadly, a lot of the English language reporting that we get from Latin America, it's always out of Miami. It's always a Miami bureau and it's always through the lens again of the United States of capital of, you know, uh, I don't know, the Department of Defense, if you will, and U.S. foreign policy. Uh, and definitely. I think you're, you have a little yeah. oversight there because we also get a lot of great uh, reporting from Glenn Greenwald's compound. Oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not for nothing. You're, not, hey, not for nothing. I mean, yeah, exactly. Look, when I was a reporter in Buenos Aires, I was definitely in an armed compound um, with lots of fountains and uh, dogs. And <laughs> then I would get on major news outlets and I would just say, um, you know, why isn't the left doing more? And in fact, the left is terrible because you're all trying to police me. Um, and I really need to clean the the you know, sort of buckets of saliva that always fill on the sides of my mouth every time I talk because I can't even s take a breath. Uh, God, that guy, man. You know, it's been a really yeah, interesting oh, 10 years guy. media wise because it's like, yeah, man, so many, so many people I used to respect in this space just kind of did a 180. Um, yeah, my team and I, we paid to go see him lecture at Lincoln Center back in the day. It was right wow. around the time that... Uh, Intercept was just being formed, and so Jeremy Scahill, who I still have a tremendous amount of respect for, just put out, um, I think it was the Dirty Wars documentary uh, yeah. following the, the release of that book, and and Greenwald is, uh, I think it just finished publishing his, the Snowden book that he did, and it was like, they were, they were just on fire, and they had so many unbelievable uh, civil libertarians and leftists kind of collaborating and swimming together, and again, I, I'm... You don't all have to align. You don't all have to get along. But the sort of the obvious nature of how everybody has gone on to sort of like pad their wallets and and lean into certain narratives that have kernels of truth, but are largely disingenuous in order to sort of like build their platforms. Um, Absolutely. And it was actually one of the areas that I, I wanted to to go with you. But before we get into sort of the, the evolving media landscape and what platforms look like these days, uh, I was wondering if you could help me dig into California politics just for a smidge, because you sort of you have like this embarrassed. Uh, no, I really never do. Um, but I, you do have this embarrassment of riches in potential candidates to take over Diane uh, Frankenstein's seat. So you've got Schiff. You've got uh, Katie Porter, um, who's, I think, been a, a brilliant advocate for the left uh, in a in a controlled environment, but just a, uh, a powerhouse nonetheless. And then you have probably one of the most significant leftist figures in congressional politics in Barbara yeah. Lee, who's yeah. running a distant third, but uh, just an amazing, an, an amazing human who had the fortitude to stand up against, um, you know, the authorization for military force yes. uh, as the only, literally the only person in Congress. So her bona fides are there, certainly. But... Um, First of all, how do you see that all, I guess, transpiring over the next, whatever it is, 18 months or so? Like, what, what's the odds on consensus out in California? And, and then also, what is your take on the whole situation? So this is going to sound dumb because I, you know, I wish, I feel like, I wish we had ranked choice voting in this election and I don't know mm. if we do. I actually don't think we do. Um, but it is, I think it might be top two, but it's not ranked choice, um, obviously. And um, so uh, Schiff, 
is going to run away with the money. Um, mm -hmm. He's got he is not pledged to not accept, you know, corporate PAC money, dark money. He's probably getting a lot of outside money, um, but he's got enough, you know, millionaires and, and rich people in California who like him because he made his, you know, name um, with the Donald Trump impeachment. And he's not terrible. Right. But he's not what we need in the Senate, especially not from a state that went to Bernie. I mean, come on. So. Look, I will mm. say I really like I think between Barbara Lee and Katie Porter, it just depends on what your priorities are. And it's a look, I think if we were in a time of war, like hot war, <laughs> um, you know, it, fast forward 15 years in the future when we're waging war on China. Um, but, you know, you could make the argument that Barbara Lee is stronger on a dove like or a diplomatically led foreign policy. Ergo, I want her in the Senate, you know, leading that. I think she is. I've heard her speak recently. I think she is sort of a, a lick to the left, if you will, from Katie Porter on, on this issue. And I definitely think Katie Porter, you know, um, visiting Israel or at least I, I believe it was a, a delegation or visiting with the prime minister. I, God, this is this is me not remembering. But like that was a bad look. It was a bad look. We know it was a bad look. I don't believe in putting Israel as the barometer for all progressive politics and Israel Palestine. I just I just don't. I don't think that's strategic. But I do think it is worrisome that, you know, she was like, we had a great meeting. You know, we'll see. Blah, blah, blah. That being There's a said, lot of other countries in the world. You could be part of a delegation. Exactly. Exactly. And and, you know, Hakeem Jeffries uh, just did a delegation to Israel as well, uh, you know, and so again, where's the daylight if push comes to shove? Are you going to fall in line um, with this? Or are you going to, you know, I think Barbara Lee has chances of like, we can pull this back from the brink should we come to, you know, war. Uh, but I also feel like Katie Porter is, in terms of that fighting spirit, she is more of a fighter. She has, I think, more class consciousness. I'm just going to be real. She does, yeah. I think, truly understand the... Um, She's been outside of Congress for long enough. I've spoken to Barbara Lee. She's great. She's been in Congress for so long. And <laughs> I do think she's tired. And I know that sounds messed up, but I do get a lot of like, ugh, this place fucking sucks vibe from her. You know, like, I'm, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> like, that's the vibe. Like, See, Katie that's Porter, great. That's interesting. Yeah, Katie, Katie Porter, Porter has a lot of energy. A yeah. lot of energy. So in terms of That's someone so who's going to fight and has who is not, but who can also compromise, I do feel like Porter, for me personally, is is where I'm at. That being said, I, I have a sinking feeling that Schiff, with all the money, may run away with it without a lot so, of grassroots effort. To stay in California for a second, just because it's so um, closely tethered to the entertainment industry and. Yeah. And you came up through the entertainment industry as well. Um, you certainly have a lot of colleagues and 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 confidants in in that space. And so, with the writer strike and with the with the SAG and after strike going on right now, that obviously is going to pretend some economic difficulty and some challenges down the road for the state of California. Also, who cares? Because this is about labor. This is a, yeah. this is an authentic labor dispute. That. To me, at least, I, I think that one of the most positive aspects of the dispute is that it helps shine a light on other causes because it starts to talk about um, the nature of capitalism and class warfare. And and I think the extremes in the Writers Guild fight have helped highlight some of the extremes in other corporate sectors that people don't necessarily think about. I mean, when you hear, sure, especially because you're connected to it, when you, when you see what some of the writers of your own personal favorite shows have made versus yes. the CEO pay, it's been really illustrative in sort of painting a better picture for all of the labor struggles. But just looking at that struggle in particular, since you are in California, you're you're certainly part of it and you certainly have come up through the industry. What what demands, because it does seem to me a little nebulous, like what demands when you're fighting something as ephemeral as AI, you're fighting something as almost ridiculous as like, what do you get paid for your knowledge and intellectual talent mm -hmm. rather than your physical labor, which is usually what we associate trade unis unionism with in this country. What kind of outcomes do you think are would be would be 
good? Where can we hang our hat on it and say, apart from just shining a light on class struggles, they also were able to achieve some equity in X, Y, and Z? Like, what are you, you and your friends and your colleagues hoping for well, out so of this, I'm, I'm, this fight? Look, I'm not in either union. I hope to be one day. I have many friends and guests of the podcast who are and are on, are striking now. Um, and I think there are people who um, some have been able to make a living. Some are just sort of like scraping by and it feels like a good credit, you know, to like then be able to do a stand up tour off of it. Um, there is not a lot of money um, to, again, like rely upon for a stable income as there once was. And they can talk about, you know, writers talk about obviously the shrinking writers rooms and all that. Um, the fact that you need many, many, many jobs to last a year rather than, you know, usually one or two jobs at most for the year, which is intense. And so I would just say it has, it's, it is hugely important and I don't know where this ends, but the reason I think it's critical and it is ironic that right now the only place that is entertainment adjacent that is not striking is news, right? Is like news mm. and journalism and all of the writers who belong into that field. And some of them are unionized. A lot of them are not unionized. Um, but you see something like AI, which is trying to undermine not just these shitty copywriting, just fucking content mill bullshit like sites where this person's getting paid, you know, like 45 a year, whatever it is, or 50 to live in New York, you know, or something insane. Um, but it's, it's like, it's a great, it's leveling everyone to this like, oh, no, no, no. That's how it starts is you start with, you know, basically like, it's making everyone's job precarious. And I think it's interesting that some of the newscasters who are part of the same corporations that are refusing to come to the table with the writers and the actors are also like at themselves at risk. So as a journalist and as a comic, like I'm kind of in the nexus of a lot of these, even though I'm not in any union. But I do think it is about the future of intellectual labor. It's the future of creative work. It is about claiming, um, cr uh, a creative worker as a work, as actual labor. And I know you're saying that it's not physical, it's not whatever. Well, arguably, it is incredibly physical, especially as an actor, especially with these long, long days and, and ridiculous shoots. Um, even reality stars that are now looking to unionize, who are completely mistreated, who don't aren't even in a union yet. I think it's galvanizing that sector as well. Um, but it's basically like, Again, it's treating everyone like they are an unpaid intern at, you know, like, I don't want to throw BuzzFeed under mm. the bus, but like at Vice, for example, fuck Vice, even though they do some good stuff, but a lot of bad stuff. <laughs> fuck, but they're also like working with the Saudi government, like fuck Vice. So, but like, you know, a young new intern at Vice, you know, getting underpaid and it's like, it's reduced everyone to that level. And then along comes AI and it's like, now everyone is... I don't know how articulate this answer is, Max, but um, no, I think is. it is it... about carving out the fact that like it is an incredibly it is incredibly labor intensive to break story on a show. Now, I know there's a lot of people listening who are like, I write stories. And you're like, OK, but do you actually like to write a quality show like to map out that the season arc? to write these characters like I've been working on one pilot that I'm like I think it's there but it's been like two <laughs> years you know and I've been like I you know it's almost there it's getting there you know you guys are not prepared if we don't stand with writers for the amount of shit content that is coming our way and like and to be real with you it's so funny where they're like oh AI is just gonna rewrite all this they already kind of do like there are writers who are talented writers, but they are tasked with rewriting like a shitty horror movie around Halloween. And it, it, there's mm -hmm. like five different writers involved. They all rewrite it to death and it kind of ends up with this sort of like run of the mill, basic whatever. And yet they all get paid. That's the difference. They get paid. It's the executive's decision to have shitty content or not. You know, it's the producer's decision whether they want this to be like boring or run of the mill. 
But at least the writer got paid. At least someone got to feed their family. At least someone got to, right. you know, pay rent or mortgage. So I don't know, Max. That's that's where I'm at with all this. Is I think it's it's about the future of valuing valuing creative work in general. And look, as someone who does internet content, and you and I know this, the downward pressure, if you will, on the market on people like me, where it's like, oh, a star of Orange Is the New Black is now a, on TikTok, or like, you know, right. trying to do. T it's like. It, <laughs> Now we're yeah. all just shilling for the algorithm, you know, and nothing is sacred and nothing and nothing is creative. It is all just content. I mean, anyway. And so and so. Yeah. Well, so when I put up the thumbnail of this interview and say, did Francesca Fiorentini sell out the left? <laughs> and is Please that, do. That's going to that's not OK. Please do. We should <laughs> I'm gonna call every like, how. If only, if only I could sell out the left. I, I, I'm just kidding. I just, all, I just think it's all, funny. We should that all I would just be... start fucking with each other just to goose the algorithm. Yeah, yeah, see yeah. If we could get as much like crazy attention on all of our stuff. Um, you know what? That actually. So, uh, I have a, a couple of policy things I, I want to get to uh, toward the end, but I'm. I know I'm sucking up a lot of your time, but. Um, you're touching on on a couple of intersections that that I find kind of fascinating about the way that you approach content. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, as a as a woman creator, one of the things that I find so interesting, we have a segment uh, called Independent Platform Man. We actually even have our own um, theme song for it. You have sort the of, best theme uh, songs. <laughs> <laughs> sort of self aware, you know, because I am an independent platform man, of course, uh, and as a cisgender, uh, you know, white presenting male in the world, I have. Agency over all things. I don't know if you know that or not, oh, but yeah. um, the world is the world is my purview, and it's for, it's mine to dissect as I see fit. <laughs> as a as a woman content creator, one of the things that I admire is that you've been very open about also be, uh, as a new mom mm -hmm. and working in the uh, the platform economy, as it were, the difficulty of navigating that, and I. Somebody had called this out recently in an interview that I, I found really terrific, which was, and I think I even brought it up in in the interview with Nathan, was that, you know, new dads aren't asked the question of like, how's it going and how are you dealing with it and how are you making yeah. it happen? But new moms are all the time. Yeah. Um, whereas you've taken a very, very, um, very open, very funny. Uh, you've given me a couple of spit take moments that I, I referenced huh? in our very first email. Um, oh, yeah, that's that, right. I won't I won't repeat here, but we'll uh, we'll leave it for for afterwards. But um, you've been very open about the the struggle of now managing a family mm -hmm. and managing your own business because that's what you are. You're a business owner as as that platform. You're the independent creator and business owner, and swimming against the tide of the independent platform man who's just always <laughs> doing things to goose the algorithm, as it were, sharing. I mean, the power of the Daily Wire network, as an example, sharing content among each other and then feeding into the algorithm is massive, with a billion dollars behind them, oh, by the way, is oh, yeah, uh, it's massively all... disruptive to the to this medium or these mediums that, that we go after. Um, so I guess my, my question for you is how, how gender conscious are you in your approach to your material – to your uh, to your worldview, how you're perceived in the general media landscape, and has it added a different sort of weathering pressure to you in trying to build momentum as a, for me, a formidable creator and 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 keen mind in the space that is like I think adding essential elements to the to the left narrative, which I think you're doing beautifully. Thank but you. does it is it a is it an extra added pressure for you? to be weighing all of these societal norms that are against you? Because again, I am an independent platform man and don't have that same type of experience. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how to answer um, that, like which part of that to answer, but for sure it sucks. It's tough to be just on like, just a left voice, a progressive voice on the internet uh, had a show on a thing, people recognize you, but they don't know where from. Maybe it was just Instagram. 
And it's really hard. And generally, people do do like a lot of like circle circular firing squads and call outs. And, you know, I really try to keep it positive because I feel like I mean, that's why I do comedy is because I, I need a break from my seriousness. I enjoy it. And I think we all the left especially needs to take everything a little bit less fucking seriously. And that mm. is I that's I guess something more. I don't believe in anything more than I believe in that uh, is that we need to have fun. Um, but because I inner I occupy these different spaces, I'm not the political wonk. I'm not the comic that you've heard about. Like it is weird. It's hard. And I do think being a woman, you know, I look at my algorithm. I mean, the like the stats on who watches and it's a lot of dudes. You know, it's a lot of dudes and people don't always expect uh, women to be talking about politics um, and a lot of us don't and a lot of us don't for very good reasons and a lot of us aren't interested in politics for very good reasons a lot of those reasons are patriarchal maybe more occupied with like like domestic responsibility having like a small creature latched to your nipple at all times you know that kind of stuff um uh your husband not knowing how to pick up after himself no but there's a lot of reasons for that and just like you know, and and also part of me is like, I wonder why women are not, you know, and to, to AOC and to the squad, heavily women, heavily women of color. I hope and I do think there is a been a change where women are starting to see themselves as actors in the political arena. And that's scaring the shit out of men. I mean, look at what they did to our abortion rights. Um, and I hope that that also um tracks in sort of left spaces you know that we can and i think it's generally like i've been in a lot of left spaces around my life you know in my life in terms of activism and different conferences and different you know professors speaking on this and that and that and oftentimes i'm you know you find yourself surrounded by a bunch of dudes having like dude fucking fear political theory <laughs> conversations and i just i just hate it like i mean and I used to be into jam bands. Oh my God, I've been surrounded by men, like just like, oh, let's check out this fucking, you know, fiddle solo or whatever the fuck. Like, you know, like I know what it is to be surrounded by dudes. And so I think it is changing, it is hard. And I often think that the people who have the most free time to let's say stream every day, work every single day um, on something like, honestly, as detached from real life as, streaming a show about politics are often men mm. and are often yeah like yeah cis straight men with you know whatever like white guys like that's generally who it is um and i also think there's something about our culture that looks to those men as like just in just as in comedy where it's like yeah there's an unassuming white guy who's gonna make me laugh he won't make me feel bad and talk about his vagina you know like that's you know, same same in politics. Like, oh, there's a me he must be sensible. He's not gonna have a real lived experience like she will. She'll bring that in, and that will color her. That will change her perception of reality. You gotta look at it from a, you know, like a the the norm. And the norm is yeah, exactly the description that I was saying. I mean, I I think you're maybe a bridge too far with that because uh, <laughs> Jerry Lewis said that women can't be funny, and yes. he was really one of the one of the forefathers of comedy. So, um, you know, I mean, kudos to you for trying, you know, yeah. it's adorable, really. Oh God, yeah. the best is when, when people will, they will, men will email me and say, they'll find my email through my website and say, I don't think you're funny. I just want you to know, you, <laughs> see, you call yourself a comic, but I don't think you're funny. And you know what that means? And it hurts every time I see that, I, it hurts me. But what it means is that they laughed at something I said. And they actually That's did right. think that it was funny. And then they were like, but you, no. <laughs> Sorry, I'm <laughs> peeking. Because like, that's a lot and, of work. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of work, yeah. Fine? Because I made you laugh or I said something that was silly and you, whatever. And it, so, um, but yeah, I think a lot of this is, you know, the final thing I will say is, Look at who the top streamers are who are women. Look at them. They are generally have like full beats of makeup. And believe you me, I try to keep up and look, you know, sharp. Full beats of makeup, boobies up to you know where, and are just generally really doing things for the dudes. 
And like, mm. they make money. I mean, that's kind of what you gotta do, except I'm lazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I can only do that so much. And so again, it's like, there is a lot of performativeness on the internet. The internet is not, um, it has the same sexism, racism, patriarchy, uh, uh, and, and homophobia that the real world does, but times a million. And, mm -hmm. and it is not neutral. These platforms are not neutral. We know what they go for. We know what they like. We know what sells. I don't have right. arms like Hassan Piker and I should get them. Yeah, I want Hassan Piker's arms, so I get it. <laughs> I totally get it. And you listen, he's a beautiful man. There's he's just no two ways about do? it. He's, he's a beautiful, beautiful man. Yeah, fuck it. He's beautiful. <laughs> um, so, all right, let's let's uh, careen towards an ending here. The, let's do it. The political slate on both sides of the aisle. Um, I, I will tell you that one of the spit take moments that you gave me recently, I think you were speaking with uh, Hari. Yeah, and talking about RFK Jr. Um, yeah. Hari was incredibly, you know, bright and funny as well. And yeah. um, I, one of you said, and I can't now. It's 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 back in my in my memory a little bit. But one of you said, "Hey, quick question: Does Sir Han Sir Han perhaps have a child?" <laughs> and it was it was like a drive off the road moment for me because I just didn't see it coming. Um, but you were talking was about just like the was okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, um, but. But you were talking about the, I mean, listen, ostensibly he's he's a, I guess he's would be considered a libertarian. He's running on the Democratic line, whatever. We have Faith Healer, um, the secret holder, Marion Williamson, running on the Democratic line. We have no, we have no Bernie this time around. There is yeah. no one from the squad who stepped up to make a challenge. DNC wasn't going to let that happen. The The absolute clown car that is the Republican slate right now. My question for you is, as a commentator, as an observer, as somebody who's now, I understand, even been in other countries where, you know, you, you get a whole different perspective on us as 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 loopy as we are. Yeah. Can you fucking believe how bad the choices are? Did you are you shocked at all that it's kind of come to this or is this sort of the inevitable conclusion to, to what we've been running up into? God, I mean, it's a good question. Like I, you know, I haven't been as like taken aback by how bad 2024 is because um, look at this country. <laughs> like, you think we deserve mm. better than that? No, this is where we are. <laughs> like two old white guys, one of them's of out fascist more so than ever. The other one's just kind of there. He'll get some stuff done, but uh, he's just kind of like, hey, at least I'm not that guy. It's like, that's exactly where we are as a nation. Um, and and that and it's very real. I mean, I think that like in terms of Biden and in terms of the Democratic Party, like each party has their own soul searching to do. Let's put the Republicans aside. But in terms of the Democratic Party, the fact that Joe Biden was Obama's running mate, okay, I guess, the safe older white guy who's been in politics for forever. But like usually your Veep is supposed to be next in line to be president. Was that always going to be the plan? Uh, and then if it was, who's prepping the next class? Like what about all of the people? What about all the other Obamas? You know what I mean? Like I'm mm. someone who really likes like Julian Castro. You know, like, but Julian Castro's not like being groomed to be the next, like, you know, president. We've got Kamala Harris, you know, who like, don't get me started. But like, there isn't anyone who is that outsider, the genuine, the, the like, I'm going to, you know, change shit. I'm going to fuck shit up. I'm going to like, which I think whether real or imagined, I think Obama definitely was offering that. I mean, shit, eight years of Bush. I was a John Kerry girl myself, obviously interpersonally a piece of shit, but like, um, politically I'm much more aligned with Carrie. Um, but, but it's amazing that they have literally don't have the people next in line, you know, sort of like, again, I, I can't believe I'm saying groomed because if they're right wingers are going to freak out, but groomed <laughs> to sort of take up that mantle, but also politically that, that eight years of Bush, that Obama's re response to that, 
being we're going to stop the Iraq war. Yes, he expanded in Afghanistan. Yes, he never shut down Guantanamo. But th that was the promise and that that really set him apart from Hillary Clinton. Nobody fucking wanted Hillary Clinton because they knew she voted for the war. We d wanted to get as far away from that as possible and that the Democrats have not been able to take up that like like, you know, um, and anti neoliberal um, populist, true, like FDR mantle that's been there for the taking and that it had to be mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders to do that is just insane. And so there's all these like there's all this just like fluff in the Democratic Party. There's all these like people who are like, well, it's their turn. Oh, yeah. But the next person in line, we don't we cannot literally survive for that person to make their careers just because they were next in line. We need to. Skip. So how are you? How are you interpreting Cornell West's, you know, entrance in, into all of this right now? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Where yeah, are you right. putting that in your in your mind space? I mean, sadly, I do think that a lot of these people who are running for president are running on um, a branding exercise, and it's a little bit of like they're using their name and and saying something a little bit different, and it. What I would love to see is a candidate from the ground up, from the real grassroots, from a movement, from a victory, from a local election that works their way um, as a progressive uh, supported by movements. And I look, Cornell West has been a supporter of movements, but there he is still kind of just a figurehead, really. Um, and I'm glad he moved away from the People's Party. I think they're speaking of clown cars. Um, but. I don't know what to make of it. Look, I did a whole episode on Marianne Williamson's uh, run with the guys from Conspirituality, which is a great podcast that I highly recommend. Oh, yeah. But, you know, they talk it's about... It's our co-host's favorite. Yeah, she yeah. She loves those guys. Do a great job. They do a great job. And so, you know, they sort of broke down Marianne Williamson um, for me. That's on the Patreon version. And and made a sort of recast her in a light that was like, oh shit, like the fact that I'm like falling for her, not really falling for her, but like kind of like what she had to say, um, that's all part of the plan, you know? <laughs> um, and it really, it came to fore with me when I asked her very pointedly, I said, do you, you know, what do you think about defeating the right? You know, like it, it's, so, you're all about love, you're all about understanding, um, and yet we have to really beat the fascist right. And she, got very mad at me and was very um, uh, chided me for saying, putting that in that terms. I don't think we have to defeat anybody. I da 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 and like sort of scolded me. And these guys, you know, Matthew Rem Remsky and, and Julian Walker from Conspirituality were like, that's kind of her thing, you know, is to be like, especially with young women, put them in their place, say that's not what it is. And also I just didn't, if you're not about beating the right, I don't like, I don't I can't get with you. You know, you're not actually right. you're not a progressive. You're not about stopping fascism. Yeah, you you have to recognize that this is a a war. It's an ideological war. And dare I say, Francesca, it's a war for the soul of the nation. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say that. Jesus Christ, but we're about to hear another 2 years of of that. Anyway, um yeah, I you know, I from a practical perspective I try to examine the can these candidacies and and whether it is Cornell West who's performed um, very admirable advocacy and also has a um, I'll invite everybody into my tent. You are my brother. You are my sister, and we'll have it out. Uh, perspective, uh, Marianne Williamson, who has I think the closest to all the beats down for progressives in terms of just aligning um, with from a from a policy perspective. She's got all all the right notes. Uh, and then you've got an RFK who offers a couple of um, it's like he, he throws some chum in for the far left and then turns around to the other side of the boat and throws chum to the far right uh, yeah. and is just sorting to sort of, I think, s just stir up the base on both sides in some sort of bizarre attempt to like unite the furthest extremes of what we have and, and play spoiler. But my criticism of all of them is there isn't any one of them who has done the practical groundwork of building political coalitions from the ground up. Yep. Now, like like a Bernie had. Now, I recognize that um, there are other great candidates from history who have who have you know come up to the top and did not do that. Donald Trump is probably the greatest example of do you really need to do that to become president? And I would offer that as the same example as to as to why not. 
Like you act, that's why you don't want somebody, even Absolutely. if he's running or she's running as your preferred candidate. You have to recognize the bureaucratic nature of the levers of power to understand that, you know, things are going to get done. You're going to be run over one way or the other unless you know where the bodies are buried and how to build strong coalitions on the ground. Right. State and by and state, the reality precinct is like, by precinct. like we, you know, we don't want the sort of left or seemingly left Trump to go in there and like burn all the bridges and just be like, nope, now I'm like everything by executive order. Like, I don't think you, you, we want some executive orders would be nice. But also, like, if we if let's say the parliamentarian, the filibuster, all of these things that are getting in the way that we all know need to be abolished and reformed, that's the kind of move we want to see, I think. But we don't want to see like, you know, the the dismantling of democracy just to achieve our aims. That's the difference between the right and the left, I would argue. Right. Right. Yeah. And th those bureaucratic, technocratic changes from within do have to have some sort of knowledge and structure and force to bear. Like I just finished a series on um, kind of reexamining the the brief tenure of Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. And the, th the thing that was most brilliant about the Carter administration was the technocratic excellence that they brought to bear on the system. And they fixed so many structural things that we take for granted these days that I think cleared the path for us to have a sustainable democracy for the next few decades to the extent that we have that. Um, because there were a few things on the precipice that had they gone demonstrably wrong would have been, you know, would have been tragic for, for the republic. Right. And on the other side, he also was not, uh, he was sort of eaten from within and then collapsed from the outside. I'm not sure that there would be any other politician in our lifetimes who would have been able to even get through that term intact the way that right. he did. It was it was a remarkable run because the forces from around the globe were extraordinary at that time. Didn't we just so, learn that there was someone on the inside working against his administration when uh, during the hostage crisis? Yeah, Henry Kissinger. Oh. Not from inside, but um, yeah. Oh, so, that asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that fucking guy. Yeah. So Kissinger was working with State Department members against Brzezinski because he had an axe to grind with him. But then, as we also later discovered, was um, one of uh, the closest associates to David Rockefeller. And it was Rockefeller's bank that was holding the escrow money from the Iranians. And <laughs> it became a financial negotiation as to who was going to get paid what interest on all the money that was outstanding. I mean, truly, truly amazing stuff. And Carter's people d had no idea. So, I mean, it just, yeah, it as it ever was. But I mean, it, you know, it's about, you know, do we blow it up or do you change from the inside? I mean, these are questions. These are great debates that we should be having on the left. You know, how much of this do you keep intact or do you burn the barn to get to the nails? But having candidates <laughs> that literally have no political acumen, I don't think is necessarily the right way to go about it. My last question for you, Francesca yeah. Fiorentini. Yeah. You did a piece on MSNBC. You did a special, a whole healthcare special that was extraordinary. Thanks. But it was at a time when the country was talking about healthcare. And here it we was... are now with some victories, some victories. I don't want to diminish the out of pocket prescription cap for seniors. Super yeah. important. Yeah. There, oh as God, much as yeah. there have been some backsliding, there have been some victories along the way. But again, in sort of fixing what is a broken capitalist system and augmenting it rather than actually looking at it from a structural, you know, uh, you know, socialist perspective or what have you. But what is the difference now in tone and what you hear and perceive uh, in the conversation about healthcare from when you just a few years ago when you did that piece to to where it is now? Because I have this impression that like, well. That's it. That's that. And we're never going to get what we want. So stop talking about it. I mean, pretty much. I mean, that's what the healthcare industry would like us to do. Um, and that piece, sadly, you know, ran in the dead of December uh, on in 2019 on the precipice of the pandemic and then also a, an election. So mainstream news um, was like, sorry, we don't need this show to sell anything because <laughs> we've got enough shit happening. But, you know, it's amazing that we've emerged from this pandemic or not emerged or sort of in it, but whatever we are, and that we have not truly come to grips. It's a, it's 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 like a trauma, you know, and that we have not actually assessed like, hey, we need a public health system that can withstand 
crises like this. And no one should be going bankrupt for the inability to pay for these vital treatments. You know, and to say nothing of like long COVID and whatnot, um, I think sadly the conversation feels it's it's that it's like gotten so we've moved so little that it almost feels hack where you're like, oh, this was a Medicare for all. We were talking about that in 2016. You're like, yeah, still hasn't right. happened. People still dying like right. Michael like Moore. Minimum coming, wage. Yeah. Michael Moore coming out with his film. What, 2008 was that seven? Um, 2009, yep. I believe a 10 year because 10 years later we talked, you know, was is sicko 2009. 10 years later, 2019 was my special, obviously same level. No, but <laughs> but like, you know, and nothing fucking changes. And you're totally right. It's important. I hope Biden talks about that at every single campaign stop about uh, the caps on med on like medicine, specifically under Medicare, Medicare's ability to negotiate prices for prescription drugs. You know, in my special, we didn't even talk about prescription drugs. I'll tell you that right now. We didn't talk about it because it felt like so much. We were there to talk about Obamacare. Is Obamacare working? What are the premiums like? And the long and short of it was, it's not working, it's incredibly expensive. But right. what's interesting about the meds discussion and pharmaceuticals is that it's the one area that Republicans, they won't say it on national television, but to their constituents and to them, to their other fellow legislators, we went to uh, Utah and spoke with a Republican legislator who was, he, they want to rein in farm big pharma. They they are so on board with that. It is a bipartisan because seniors thing. vote because seniors vote and it's expensive, especially for this was fucking crazy. The piece that we couldn't include because it was just felt like so much. It was it was not that long of a special. It's cheaper for Utah to send their employees, right? Gover uh, state employees, send them to Mexico first class, pick them up in a limo, keep them stay, get them to stay in like a five star hotel, obviously. All <laughs> expenses paid trip to Mexico to buy their meds in Mexico than it is to pay for Humera or whatever here in the United States. And so nah, what did they feels. do? They literally Max created a program to do that. So there's a program where they send state employees over to Mexico and they can get their meds cheaply. And that way they who are footing the bill for this don't have to pay as much. You just get them wow, on the pocketbook, wow, wow. man. Yeah. Insane. So it's like it's the pocketbook issues, man. And and so and again, back to why these Democrats, they can't it's just it's so it's so there for you to pick up. And instead, you've got RFK and other medical loonies and conspiracy theorists. They're the ones who are able to, thanks to the last 10 years of inaction, drive that wedge into all of our suspicions about big pharma anyway, the medical industry anyway. And COVID mm. became the perfect storm for that, for them to capitalize on. So look, if, if there's a vacuum here, an intellectual, a policy, a political vacuum, someone's going to step in. And they did. That's such a good point. Yeah, that's such a great point. Um, I love this. I love your show. I, I really Thank do. You. And and the way I think about it, I, it, as I was thinking about you coming on, I, I was, um, it, it, the way I consume your content, it, it almost implies that it's a guilty pleasure because I, it, it's fun. So I, there's, you know, like, like everybody, I've that's got a couple of shows, a couple of so podcasts. Great. But it's not. It's not a guilty pleasure because there, I get meaning out of it. And I think one of the things that you do really, really well is, you, is that you you are able to inject absurdist humor into it sometimes, just some really raw human stuff, and mix it together with this cocktail of intellect that allows us to learn at a, at a deeper level. So I think you're performing Thank a great you. service. I'm so happy to be kind of uh, you know associated and in this sphere with you and. And I hope we can do this again. Yes, absolutely. You got to come on the show now. That's Giddy what this up. means. All right. Francesca Fiorentini, where can everybody find you? Just give us all the stuff. Yeah, find me um, on YouTube at Franny, Fio, F-R-A-N-I-F-I-O, or type in the bituation. Spell it out, B-I-T-C-H. Don't try and like B-I-T. 
I A. I don't know. I don't know how you would spell it <laughs> otherwise, but spell it out. Vituation Room Podcast. So it's streams on YouTube every Tuesday and Friday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. You can also get it on all podcast platforms. And um, you can follow me on all the socials at the same handle, at Franny Fio. I'm on literally everything, but I hate all of it. And I hate Twitter. <laughs> oh, no, I hate, I hate Instagram the least. So maybe I'm the most there. Okay, that's fair. All right, well, I appreciate it. And uh, I know the unfuckers do as well. So uh, thank you for appearing on the show. Frantifa we'll you, uh, says hi to else. the unfuckers. Thank you. I don't thank know. That, that's, boy, that's some, that's some coming together. That's some unite the clans, huh? <laughs> yeah. It's tough stuff. Thanks so much. We'll talk thank to you, you soon. Mmm, delicious. Hey, everybody. It's Max. Let me ask you something. Do you like coffee? I love coffee. I drink a lot of coffee. I drink so much coffee that I'm actually 99% coffee at this point. Maybe that's why I haven't slept since the 1990s. Do you know what else happened in the 1990s? My friends on the Puspatuck Reservation founded a coffee company called Native Coffee Traders. And we partnered up with Native Coffee Traders to produce our own line of coffee that helps support not only our show, but indigenous entrepreneurship on the Puspatuck Reservation. So here's what we were able to produce together and why I think you should buy only our coffee and double your intake of caffeine. It all started with a simple but powerful premise. Unf*** your morning. That's right, our entire coffee line started with this bag of beans, grown in Nicaragua, shipped directly to the Puspatuck Reservation, and roasted with love. But because we think that coffee should be consumed every minute of every day, we then launched Unf*** your afternoon. That inevitably led to a discussion among our listeners, some of whom said, hey Max, I too love coffee, but you know, for the aroma and the taste, and I don't want to be up all day and all night like you. So, we launched a decaffeinated unf***ing. And that led to a discussion between our over-caffeinated audience who said, I love on your morning and I love on your afternoon, but sometimes, boy, it'd be nice to have something right in the middle. You have anything a little more mellow? And I said, surely, surely I do. Don't call me Shirley. How about Mellow Maynard, affectionately named for John Maynard Keynes? And that's it. So if you want to get sufficiently jacked up to take on the day, or if, like me, you hit three o'clock and every day you just feel the urge to <clears throat> go to UNFTR.com to find out how to purchase our line of native roasted coffee. Help us, help them, help yourself. Here ended the commercial. <laughs> Anyhow, oh, because I love coffee. Unf your morning. That's right. We launched this. How to un? If you tapped into my veins, you would find only coffee.